yes, they can pass the virus onto their babies. So their babies can become HIV positive. And this can occur before the baby is born. So we're talking about the baby in the, in the uterus can become infected. Or it can be a situation where during delivery, the baby can become infected as the baby passes through the vaginal canal that has a lot of fluids and blood in there um, during that birthing process. Being exposed to all of that fluid, the baby can become infected. And also the baby can catch it through breastfeeding, okay? But the risk is very low for women who are on their antiretroviral drugs. So a woman who is pregnant and HIV positive, if she's taking her antiretroviral drugs properly, then it decreases the chance of the baby getting becoming HIV positive. It can decrease it to 1% or even less, okay? So the important message there is to take drugs properly. Healthcare workers can also become infected because you can have accidents. So for example, a nurse or a doctor administering an injection to somebody who's HIV positive and for whatever reason, the needle accidentally sticks, sticks he or, um, or her. They can become infected. But of course, with quick response by taking um, what we call PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, you can reduce the chance of that healthcare worker um, be becoming positive because if because if you get on those treatment quickly um, you can reduce the chance of it happening right so what about the tests for hiv now the only way you're going to know if you have the virus within you is to get tested okay it's important to know your status. If you know your status, then you have the information necessary. Very, very important, powerful information to keep you and your partner healthy. So there are three types of tests. And these are some general, um, general headings for the three types of tests. The first one we call nucleic acid test, the NAT test, which Basically, what this test is doing is testing for the presence of the virus in the blood. It's testing for the virus presence and it's testing for the amount of virus in a certain amount of blood. That's what we call viral load. So usually for this one, we're talking about taking a sample of the blood from the, from the main vein, from a vein in the arm, for example, the subclavian vein right here, take a sample of that blood, it is sent to the lab for testing, all right? And um, for this one, many times you can get your results back in, in, say, in a few days time. So that's one of the most reliable way of determining if somebody is HIV positive or not. The second one we have is an antigen antibody test. And the, these two terms can be a little uh, complex, but just to simply put it, usually when we are exposed to something foreign, a foreign matter in our body, we call it an antigen. So the virus, you take the virus, the person becomes infected with the virus, the virus is an antigen, all right? And you find that the virus gives off this substance we call P24. So there's a test that can identify the P24 in our blood, okay? And there's also another term we call antibody. Usually when we're exposed to different viruses, our, our immune system responds by producing what we call antibodies. So we have some simple tests that can identify the antigen and or identify the antibody. 
And so some of the tests you can simple by simply pricking the finger, getting a few drops of that blood, putting it on a cartridge, a special cartridge, and in say 30 minutes or so, it can tell you if you're HIV positive or not, okay? Then the third one is what we call our antibody test. This one only tests for antibodies. And again, with this one, you can swab the mouth. So to do this test, they'll take a little swab on a stick, put inside the mouth in the jaw and get a few cells and, and fluid, oral fluid there, put that in a little cartridge, test it, and in 30 minutes, it can give you some results, all right? So HIV tests are typically performed on blood or oral fluids and they can also be performed on urine, okay? Now, where can you get your tests done? This is just a little map I clipped from, 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 from online, and it speaks to different areas where tests can be done. This one speaks only to Kingston. Of course, there I'll add, quickly add that there are other sites across the island. So HIV testing can be done free of cost in many, many, in many um, establishments across the island, one of which is Jamaica Aid Support for Life. You can get the test done there. You can get the test done at Shares, um, which is at the University Hospital for the West Indies. The, through the SARA, which is Southeast Regional Health Authority, through them, you can get it done through the from Sarah through Comprehensive Clinic, which I think is on Slipen Road. And then there are also private labs at Central Labs on where of course of those places more than likely you'll have to pay for it. There's also Winwood Road Medical Center. So there are different places that can be visited to have the test done. Some pay, some of them you don't pay. So there are numerous non-governmental organizations like Jamaica Aid Support for Life that will off offer the test free of cost. Um, and there are some government agencies that will offer it like the comprehensive clinic among other places. And of course, quite often we hear of these health fairs that are going on around that will offer HIV testing and counseling. So let's talk quickly, because I think my time is running out, just about to run out. Myths, some myths about HIV AIDS. First one, HIV is a death sentence. That is not true. That is no longer the situation, simply because of the improvement in treatment that exists now. I've spoken about different, about the antiretroviral drugs that are present they have been doing a wonderful job. So persons now can live long, normal lives. A next myth, you can tell if someone has HIV by looking at them. Total nonsense, not no gusso, right? So persons with HIV infection might display symptoms that are similar to other types of infection, like fever, fatigue, general mal malaise. These are things typical of even the flu virus, all right? So you can't just look at somebody and just determine that, that they have that AIDS or HIV infection. Uh, Another one, HIV positive people cannot safely have children. Rubbish. I've just explained to you that yes, there, there are pregnant women who are HIV positive. If they take their medication properly, they can reduce drastically the chance of their baby becoming positive. Uh, the, the, most co the, the, the recommended mode of delivery is really C-section, okay? Yes, natural delivery, but that prefer that really for women who their HIV, their viral load is what we call undetectable or very, very low. But in general, C-section is the recommended um, route of delivery. And breastfeeding is not really, really recommended either. Bottle feeding is what is recommended because remember I said earlier on that the infection can be spread 
through breastfeeding. But I'd hasten to say though, if the, if the mother's viral load or the amount of virus in her blood is very, very low, then it's a lesser chance of her spreading it through breastfeeding. Kissing. You cannot get HIV, AIDS, or AIDS, well, HIV infection from kissing, okay? The amount of virus that's found in the saliva is too small to start an infection, okay? So that's amazing. You get it through kissing. And I think my last slide speaks to sweats, tears, urine, feces of someone who have HIV, you will not get it from, 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 from coming in contact with these fluids unless you have some sort of wound and you push your hand in it or something like that. But for the most part, no, you won't get it from handling um, somebody's sweat, tears, urine, or feces because for the most part, the, virus, the amount of virus in these fluids are so small that they really don't trigger an infection. All right, and so this is where I say thank you very much for your attention to my presentation. Lisa, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Montre. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to take um, our questions from the end of our second presenter. That's why we're going to open the floor for questions from everyone. So, it is my pleasure at this time to introduce to you our second speaker for today, uh -huh. the founder of Jamaica Community of Positive Women. He launched it in 2010 and legally registered this organization in 2013. He therefore serves as the Jamaica Community of Positive Women convener. For over 22 years, she has been a leader in the struggle for HIV treatment access and women's sexual reproductive health. She has served as a founder, board member, or staff of multiple organizations and networks, including the International Community of Women, the Jamaica Network of Serum Positives, the Caribbean Regional Network of People Living with HIV, and the Jamaica Country Coordinating Mechanism of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. It is my pleasure to welcome this evening Miss Olive Edwards as she speaks to us on reducing HIV stigma and discrimination. Olive? Lisa, I'm not seeing my screen. Not seeing your screen. screen. I don't know what happened. It's All right, stop sharing and start again. One more time. I can't even find that. All my meeting controls are gone. Um, Press escape for a minute and you may see it. Let me see what happened. I, I've tried that. I'm not sure what happened. I went to share. Okay, let's stop share and try again. Right, wonderful. Um, and then let me get that there. Okay, share screen. I tried to put it up before. You're not having it still? I'm not sure what's happening with it. Uh, we are seeing it. I guess you're not seeing it. Do you want I am to not seeing it? I'm not seeing the screen at all, but that's fine. Um, right. I'll just start at the beginning. So good evening, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure. Hi, do you want me to share my screen? 
Um, it's fine because I can see it. For, I have a, my copy here I can work with. Okay, just so that I prefer to see the screen, but I, I guess it's not giving me that. <laughs> so let me share my screen then, and then you'll be able to see my screen. Okay. All right, so can you stop sharing um, a minute and then let me view it? I'm not sure why I'm not able to have it do that, but I, I don't mind what I had a while ago. So what you want to do? It's fine. Share yours and let me see what that might. Tried it today and it was fine. So. I know. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> Can you see my screen? I am seeing it quite right now. I'm not sure why I wasn't having it. Um, That's fine. While ago. And I, as I said, sharing it now is difficult for me to That's use fine. because I am seeing half a screen. All right. So just tell me when you want the slides changed. So I know we need to put up my own, okay. So we are going to be talking about stigma and discrimination and how we would want to reduce it. Um, HIV stigma has to do with the irrational or negative attitudes and behaviors and judgment that is driven by our fears. And discrimination is unfair treatment laws and policies. Next. Critically important is that HIV-related stigma and discrimination are persistent barriers to ending the AIDS epidemic because they prevent people from seeking HIV prevention, testing, and treatment services. And as you would have learned just before, it is important to know your status in order to access the treatment you need. Next. Internalized stigma is in settings that go beyond just the health sector. So you can be facing stigma in education setting, the workplace, with the justice system that is supposed to protect us, our families, our communities, and for some people in emergency and emer humanitarian settings. And we are having that experience now with corona, where to go into the treatment sites, you have to pass through different layers of of security checks that some people are not willing to face. We want to look at why stigma and discrimination is important that we reduce it. It will reduce HIV transmission. I looked at some of the data and noted that between 1982 or when we had our first case and 2017, a total of 36,553 were diagnosed. And of that amount, 10,127 died by the statistics of 2017. Our death rate has declined. Our new infections have declined. So for last year, we had 700 persons diagnosed. And that is in the right direction. However, of those now diagnosed, 16% do not know this. For before reach diagnosis, we have 27,000, over 27,000 persons living with HIV. Of that amount, 16% don't know their status. Of those who know their status, 44% of them have access care. Of that 44%, only 66% of them are at viral suppression. Remember, as it was just noted, that you need viral suppression in order to not infect your partner or your children. And viral suppression is not an end, it is, it is a journey. And therefore, you may be viral suppressed now and then issues in your life, especially as it relates to stigma and discrimination, can distract or derail your suppression. And you are back to where you started. Next. We are going to be looking at how we now look at reducing stigma and discrimination. And I want us to keep in mind the World AIDS Day team that goes beyond World AIDS Day because it was a commitment we were making on World AIDS Day as we go forward. Global solidarity, shared responsibility. Next. Next. 
Now, stigma and discrimination, we have symptoms and diagnosis. So many of us suffer from it. All of us have to deal with it, but we don't realize it in one way or the other. We are either the perpetrator or the person who are, is exposed to it. So for this conversation, we look at what is stigma and discrimination in the context of HIV and AIDS. We have internal and external. The symptoms that we suffer from, whatever treatment we want to, we should have, and how we are personally dealing with it. We look at remedies for HIV discriminatory behaviors that work best in our settings and where we can find and share them. Next. Now for internal stigma, it starts with the person who is diagnosed. So this self-stigma allows the person to have the reaction that they had towards other persons now having to deal with themselves. So whatever thoughts you had before you were diagnosed, they don't just go away when you are diagnosed. They persist and they continue to influence how you will approach your treatment. So that internalized stigma now can cause denial, a failure to access and adhere to treatment. And you will be part of the group that continue to perpetuate the myths and misconceptions, both by your words and some of your actions. So you'll hear people saying wrong things about people living with HIV and you will even join in and agree with them and you know it's not true. And your actions as well, will show that you still have not been de dealing well with the stigma and discrimination you felt from before you were diagnosed. Next. Within our peer groups, our networks and organization, there's also internal stigma in the families as well and in our communities. But we mostly now, at this point, are going to look at the internal stigma within our peer groups and our organizations because some of us are then referred to settings in which we are better able to cope if we have others who will tell us how they are managing. So when you get into these peer groups, you are still suffering from your fears, the mistrust. And so sometimes there's untruth and the giving of false information. Then there's judgment that can result in isolation and rejection. The situation you're dealing with amplifies the turmoil of post-traumatic stress that may, be, may go untreated, and it does not allow you to relate to others in a healthy or cordial way. So there is always some tension and turmoil going on within the groups themselves as well. This stigma and discrimination hinders the organization growth and its function, for which it was created originally most times, which is to eliminate stigma and discrimination. Next. In external stigma and discrimination, it is in the settings that we work, in the settings where we meet people, in the places where we work, and also in the laws and policies that exist. Our families and the communities, they continue to spread myths and misconceptions. They behave discriminatory towards the persons by spreading gossip. In the family, they may stop using the utensils they use or they isolate and exclude you from family things that were normal for the family to do. In the education setting, the children and their parents are exposed to actions, words that sometimes breach their confidentiality and their medical knowledge is known. And children will hear other children in school saying, telling them that the parents have HIV and the teachers will be upset and want to know how many people have it and which people have it. Or if it's a teacher, she might find her colleagues not wanting to be in the same space at the same time that she is or he is. Next. In the workplace, the co-workers can express a lack of sensitivity by the things they say. 
and the questions they ask. And they also will discuss your personal business as if it's a disability that they can speak about now. The employers sometimes breach confidentiality. They may also make it difficult for people to keep their jobs. In the justice system, we have law that discriminate in that they, it criminalizes disclosure. So you need to tell persons that you're positive. It criminalizes sex acts and sex work. So those persons who have issues related to how they are perceived or believed to be, they will fail to seek treatment when they need it. And then their rights are breached. People can abuse them. The law enforcement officers sometimes lock up persons, disclose their status in the station, say they are from whatever community and how they are then treated is against the law and their rights are breached. The justice system that fails to address discrimination and protect the rights of all can be the cause of violence experienced by people made more vulnerable or living with HIV. Now, based on all of those seemingly not significant because some of us say we don't know anybody who's experiencing it. I remember probably saying I didn't know Jamaica to discriminate against people and met a young lady who had lost all her belongings because the family decided that the man was now dead. It was she who would bring it into the relationship and who wanted the bed, who wanted the little house that she had built and the property were now abusing her. So she went to the station to seek some support and while she's there waiting for police to come in, accompany her to go and pick up her items. She was waiting a long time and they tell her no vehicle was there and they would come and go. And each time a new one would ask, so what she near for? No, she with the aids and then um, she wants her to go take up her things because people are around her. So we have had people face those things. With the coronavirus, people will go to the clinics and first they need to see the security guard. And the security guard with oh, she had go around the, that place around there. So. so they'll be telling people immediately that they know where you're going and what you're going for. Some people don't go. So they have lost their medication, not access or their checkup with their doctors. Next. Um, workplace. For the remedies again, we look at our workplace. We need to make sure that there is policy to protect all workers from discriminating behaviors and actions. The justice system, the justice system should address discriminatory laws that fail to protect the rights of all. We need to ensure that our laws that influence policies and programs does not rob people of their dignity and human rights. With that in mind, next, we are, we are at um, side solidarity and shared responsibilities. With that in mind, JCW recognizes the importance of solidarity and it is why we exist. We exist to lead efforts towards partnerships and collaborations, raising of consciousness, mobilizing, monitoring, mentoring women, organizing and advocating on the issues that directly impact our lives. A woman immediately treated and supported, it immediately reflects on how she manages her health and her family. If she's not healthy, she cannot manage her family. She cannot support them, she cannot earn an income to look after them. We need to ask ourselves, where can we find shared and share these remedies. It starts in our minds. We need to love ourselves and love others. It is love of neighbor is not just the person next door to you because you can be a neighbor to someone at any point. The space we are knowing in this conversation we're having, um, a big up to Bethel Baptist for their continued um, support for people living with HIV and for how they manage 
the issue. Accurate information is available. Do your research, ensure that your information is correct. So World Health Organization provides information and, and guidelines as to how we manage corona, HIV, and any other illness that creates this fear that makes us discriminate against persons. The treatment sites will provide persons living with HIV with directions and referrals. We have the service organizations such as J, Jamaica Aid Support for Life, JN Plus that registers discrimination if you are discriminated against and provide you with the support you may need. JCW Plus that focuses on leadership for women who want to make sure that they are managing themselves and their HIV issues. JCW's priority is to focus on efforts of ICW, which is our larger international network, which is why I'm saying we believe in global solidarity. And we have four key priority areas that we believe our partnership and collaboration, collaborative efforts can achieve more greater impact. So we are focusing on these areas, the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women and their partners, ending violence against women and gender-based violence, access to treatment and care for women and their family, and economic justice. Economic justice is important in how people are going to manage their lives and themselves. What has worked for us? Community engagement. So we have various activities therapeutic activities that we do with women when we are sensitizing others. We make ribbons for ending violence against women, the 16 days of activism, and ribbons for World AIDS Day, which we then will share with persons as a reminder. And women like to do that. It's part of their feeling of self re resilience and managing. We believe that person, personalizing what is available recommendation is important because it's okay to be always saying end stigma, stop violence, when we ourselves, based on our actions and our behavior, we are perpetuating both. We refer persons for assistance to various places, including the treatment sites, the church, Bethel is one space where we recommend persons to go for counseling. And there's a pharmacy too that we utilize. We know that it is important that we take our responsibility as people already coping with the illness seriously. So we help women to accept the responsibility that they have towards making sure that HIV stigma and discrimination ends with them. Last slide. Here's some information as to how you can make contact with us. And remember, undetectable means untransmittable, but it is not an end, it is a journey. And stigma and discrimination is not done. It is real, it is ever present but it's negative impact on HIV we need to look at so that in solidarity, we will share responsibility of ending HIV stigma and discrimination. I want to thank you for this opportunity to present. Thank you very much, Olive. Um, thank you for, for coming and taking the time. And as, par as the chair of the HIV AIDS ministry, uh, we look forward to strengthening our partnership as we continue to work together. Brothers and sisters, it is now time to open the floor for about 15 minutes or so, so that you have the two experts here with you that you can ask uh, your questions. You can ask by. Um, Raise your hand. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm not sure they have a hand raising feature, but they can put it in the chat. Uh, Deacon Hughes and I are monitoring the chat 
uh, for the questions. Deacon Hughes is also part of the HIV AIDS um, ministry. And so we open the floor at this time. Where is the raised hand? Thank you. I don't see. Good no, evening, everyone. Lisa, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. I, I wanted a clarification on the question of criminal sen um, sentencing for non disclosure. Is that a applicable in Jamaica, because as I recall, there had been quite a discussion on how you prove the intention in terms of the person who transmit disease without disclosing. How do you know that they willingly and intentionally did so? Or was it done out of ignorance? So is it, is it law now that persons who fail to disclose are treated with sentencing? Is that law in Jamaica or it was just a general thought? Any one of our speakers can take that. It was tabled to be part of the policy. So we had started to look at it and had presented our arguments against it becoming a offense. I have not looked at it lately because we have so much going on, but it was it is stable for Jamaica to have that. We had been comfortable for a long while saying, oh, we'd never go that route, but it was stable. Thank you. Just now need to look at where it's at because we looked at it at the same time we were looking at the Sexual Offenses Act. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Moncrief, I have a question. Um, one of the things I have uh, struggled with in, in our ministry at Bethel is for patients to be adherent to their therapy. Um, and I think it's not just that they are affected by the virus, but it's because there are, they are so many other social issues that are happening at the same time. Um, what would you recommend in terms of me encouraging or, you know, strategies to change certain behaviors? Um, the thing is, well, it, the recommendation will have to be based on a particular behavior uh, and it, for example, what, what type of behavior you're talking about? Just not taking the meds? Um, is it that they are, because I know sometimes, I think persons need to recommend, recognize the importance of the adherence process. Because once you, once you miss, once you miss, even as much as two, three percent of your medication, you're going to find that it's going to drastically affect how well the meds work for you. And we really want um, as higher than a 95 percent adherence for the medication to really work properly so you can achieve the undetectable level. Um, so it's going to be recommendation going to be based on particular um, behavior, but what must come across first of all is the importance of adherence 
And sometimes we use this word adherence. We have to sometimes break down these terminologies so people know what adherence really means. Because if they don't know what it means, then, you know, they won't adhere. <laughs> they won't, <laughs> they won't um, take the meds as, as, they as, 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 as they should. So that message has to come across. I know in cer certain regions, HIV management is a holistic approach. So the counseling is important in addition to the, the medical follow-ups and so on. And in each of these um, settings, that imp the, the importance of adherence must be emphasized. I guess sometimes the social issues, for example, as you know, some, some of the medications um, make them feel upset. So oh, yes. have nausea, et cetera. And, uh, yes, just and, um, and communication important there because I, I know of cases where persons will not take the medication simply because they don't like how it feels or it makes them feel. And so that has to be communicated with, with, with the pharmacist. And so um, an alternate med can be recommended because there are alternatives. There are a wide range of, of antiretroviral. If this one is not working too well for you, for example, the well-known efavirenz, we know that causes some serious nightmares. It can cause suicidal tendencies and so on. So if somebody is experiencing that, then you may want to switch it, switch, switch the meds. So the communication is very, very important. In simple, clear language, that's another thing too. Simple, clear language. Remove all the technical terms, break down the, 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 the language, and communicate with the person. Well, let's look at the practicality of communicating that your medication is not making you feel well. Your first line of communication perhaps is your adherence counselor or your social worker mm -hmm. to the treatment site. However, it may seem like it's a medication, but the social needs are more than the meds. People are more than the pills they take. And so in our effort to have people adhere to the medicine, we may not be hearing the real issue that would make them, because it is my mouth I'm going to put it in. So I need to be the one who take that responsibility. But it is the outer things that are not being addressed that the person is now going to be struggling with. So I am there, you, we, you need to take the medicine, you need, and the person is okay. Then I wonder, when we're going to put them together today, um, <laughs> I take off something off of the buckle, my auntie, I go visit the guy, I go visit, and all of those things. So you can't go and talk because they have this issue. Is this person going to give them the money or going buy the food, send the fitness to school, and so on? So their challenge is not whether or not you're giving them and complaining whether they take charity for the month. This is where they're going to put it. Or they're going to get home with it. First of all, they may have had to say that I'm going somewhere else to get to the space where it is, but you don't get that part of the story because it is their reality that it's a struggle. And Corona proved it even more when there were more people in the space. We kind of not going out to more people in the space. Yes. So in your space where you live, there's more people. To go to the clinic is more people. If you are not among the 44%, that determine in their resilience that we are going, we don't care who you is, we're going to take with medicine, we're going, and maybe have to cost this some the other gate. We may have to advocate to something, our fans want to advocate for us, but we are going. That 44% is not half, and we are looking at 90% yes. of people who are taking their meds being suppressed, and that calls for adherence. So now we have to be looking at even more social issues. Corona has made more people poor, mm -hmm. hungry, not knowing how, some don't know where, they, some didn't know that they weren't living anywhere. It is since Corona when there's the space where them normally would automatically go stay now and again, it's no longer available because more people stay in one minute. Then they suddenly discover that we are there. So, my auntie also is available for me to sleep. We can't stay in my mother's yard. 
me and the person when we used to talk to now and talk, and some people have lost relationships during the time. So we have even more work to do as me, most of what we have achieved over time can be eroded as we become comfortable and think HIV done and Corona is another thing and they can't use sex as an excuse for not treat people well with Corona. So they have to address it. In HIV, you make all kinds of excuses, them kind of people and you label people in all kinds of needs not to give them the care they need. Corona is saying you can't do that and then you had HIV to it and the fears that people have and we are not even addressing some of the mental trauma that people were going through before and they added one to Corona. So there is a lot of challenges in getting and keeping that 44 percent in treatment and adhering plus the other um 56 percent or so that we want to make sure are accessing the treatment so the side effects will become secondary and in their support space they normally find out what they can do to address the, the side effects that are affecting them and most times it's a mental state of um, comfort, the side effects go away. Yes, indeed. Um, this reminds me of a term that we use called patient optimization. You know, yes, the, 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 the guideline says once you're diagnosed, you're to be on antiretroviral. But one of the things that must be assessed is that patient ready to take it. Has this patient really accepted one that they're HIV positive? Okay, let us say somebody has accepted it. But can this person, does this person have the bus fare to come to the clinic? Does this person, what's this person's nutrition like? Does this person have food to eat? And so on. So all these things certainly impact on it. I refer to, refer to that as optimization of the patient. So thank you very much for that, Olive. Yeah. I, th I think it's a, a, a really big concern um, because as Olive uh, presented on the stigma and discrimination. You know, another challenge we have is when they come um, to our monthly meetings and you may be checking their medications, uh, you recognize that they have uh, poured the medications out of the original bottles and put them in other bottles because uh, not everyone maybe in your household knows, you know, of the situation. And so it's a way of shielding and, and protecting themselves um, yes. from being stigmatized, you know. Um, so some have come to, to accept and are open and, and, and speak about their status. But we still do have a lot of persons who are afraid, who are fearful, and really should not be. If as Olive mentioned, you know, we treat them with love and compassion, which we should do as brothers and sisters of, as in faith in Christ. We have a question from Kirk Wilson. Kirk, you may go ahead and unmute your microphone. Yes, good evening, brothers and sisters. It's actually uh, my wife, Donna, that has the question. Good night, everyone. Okay. Moderator. Um, question. I recently came across um, data suggesting that there are no new forms of presentations for um, antiretroviral medications in the form of injectables. And so this would be given on a monthly basis or a less frequent basis than daily. I think this probably could stem the issue of compliance. Um, is there any further data on this and whether or not in our local setting, it, is there a, you know, a drive to possibly get to that um, level? Thank you. Thank you for, for your question. I know there's constant research that is going on um, in an effort to reduce adherence, and that certainly is one, one of them. Uh, in terms of it reaching Jamaica, I've never, I, I don't know of it being on our market at all. I don't know if, if, if Lisa or Olive know of it being reaching Jamaican market. I don't know of it being here as yet. But you know, considering we have right here in Jamaica nearly all the different classes of antiretrovirals available, I, I won't be surprised that that one reaches here at some point in time. Um, that, but that would certainly assist with the adherence issue. What I'm aware of is in the promotion of PrEP, 
Mm -hmm. where those who are not positive can take antiretroviral to protect themselves. Um, the current medication being used, they have identified one where the person can get an injection once per month. Like the corona vaccine, it is in the making and not everyone and everywhere is going to be able to access it. It is not necessarily for those who are living with and now need to be on their medication. It is for those who we are seeking to prevent from being, that's what I have read so far. I saw it last week and I was excited for it. The, that is also used for persons who are not yet positive. When we checked, it does not necessarily benefit women in that they'd still be taking medication seven days per week for it to work for them. While for others, men can take like four doses, the woman would still need to take a consistent seven days for it to start working for her to protect her from HIV. So a reality check, she'd be as if she was positive and taking medication. So while it, we applaud all the new things that are coming in, we must realize and accept the fact that like if you have high blood pressure, diabetes, any of the other issues that ail mankind, there is a regime that now exists and it's better than before. I had friends who died from the high dosage of AZT when there was testing and people were told that they need to take it every four hours and they were waiting on the alarm clock, barely sleeping like you're feeding babies um, to take this medicine. Some died in the process because too much of a high dosage, but they didn't know. So it's going to be where we're looking at what exists now, what we have, see how it works for us. And I am holding the pharmacist I'm excited to hear that. Yes, you can tell the pharmacist that it's not working so well. I need something to address this um, issue of it not being settled in my stomach. But I do say to women, most times, when we are contented in mind, we feel less effects of all the other things that are not working, including things you have to take. Thank you, Olive. I see in the chat. A I see a question coming. Yes, go ahead, Grace. Um, I was just saying that there's a question. Janet Garrell has a question. Right. A friend of mine is HIV positive and has stopped taking his meds and is taking herbal medicine. He has been doing well for years, says he has tested negative. Is this possible? I'll just mute my mic and listen. I'll, what I'll say is that I don't know of any herbal medicines um, that can make you HIV negative, for one. Um, remember, there are persons who can even live without any meds for years without actually showing any symptoms, you know. So one, one can't say, I can't necessarily say the fact that he's doing well right now is because of the herbal medicines, um, herbal medicine that he is he is taking. Um, but I can't, I, I don't know of any herbal medicine that can 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 cure AIDS. There are a lot of suggestions out there by herbalists and so on that says this can cure AIDS and that can cure AIDS and so on. But I don't know of any. Um, so I can't speak to speak to that, really, other than to say he needs to be careful. And, and, and additionally, we must, be, we must realize, too, that there are several herbal compounds that sometimes mask the results of tests, okay? So it's not necessarily that the herb is working and the person is HIV negative. But sometimes some of these herbal substances can mask the results of, the, of tests. Just like, just like how they say sometimes um, some, some diabetics and they take a lot of cerise and they, 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 they get a nice reading. And that's simply because the cerise masks some of the results of the diabetes tests. Okay, so we have to be careful of, of these herbal medicines. Um, agreed, Sean. Um, I have heard of, of um, drug holidays, mm -hmm. and I'm not so sure that uh, the person actually goes negative, but 
it is possible sometimes for persons to sustain a very low viral load. Indeed. So meaning that the, the amount of virus in the system is not detectable. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, usually they can't uh, transmit. However, once they stop taking their medications over a period of time, the virus will begin again uh, to multiply mm -hmm. and to destroy um, cells or, or T cells or cells that are responsible for keeping our immune system healthy. And, and and to add to that, Lisa, I think what happens is that when it comes back, it's as though it comes back um, <laughs> with a vengeance. Yeah. And so it, 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 it is more detrimental to the person at this time than if they were consistently taking their medication. Hi, Olive. That's because the person has now developed resistance. So yeah. even more aggressive. Yes. And they, then they are gone, and um, those who have been persistent are still here 30 or 40 years later. So we have lost several along the way. Again, it has to do with, remember, how you felt about HIV before you were diagnosed. does not go away. And so, and we have a social behavior or something where we wish we could say something like the yam donor country or the mosquito or something else. So denial is part of the whole process of not dealing with it well. So even when some persons are doing pretty well, um, and we think, okay, they are getting there, they are accepting that they need to manage it. But I've seen people do it with diabetes and other things as well. And I'd remind people of that. So you think they are doing well and they come and say, you know, me get ill, the church and the pastor I may, 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 may get the vagina or something. Okay, they're back to square one. Because it is difficult to deal with the questions from the family, the perceived or the real slights. Because many people have learned now how to mask the discrimination and the stigma that they feel towards positive people. And even the positive people themselves have sort of said, okay, I'm working well with it. And then they have a relapse based on a situation or circumstances which could be at the clinic, in their relationship. The, the, they and the partner could have something that could have nothing to do with HIV. We just don't get along. And they still have to doubt, wonder if it's, that is the reason why they are in this position or where they are single again, or the relationship didn't work. When it could be a difference of how people relate as humans. So it's a lot of work that still needs to be done. It's not over. It never will be until there is no more, but we are humans and it is here and we have to learn how we manage it. Even if you want a holiday, but the reality it is there and the way how we manage it is going to have to be where solidarity and responsibility by all people, whether you have it in the family or you yourself is exposed and dealing with it, or you protect your children from being exposed is also relevant. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, brothers and sisters. We are coming to the end of our program today. I would really like to extend a special thanks to our speakers, uh, Dr. Moncrief and Ms. Edwards, for taking the time out of their schedule. They, they both uh, contribute a lot to this area and recognize the importance of sharing with us today. And we thank you for saying yes. We want to thank our team who set up our Zoom meeting for today and for the continued support, uh, recognizing Lawrence Brown and Gary Callum and Conroy Daly, who helped to uh, set up, as I said, and to host the meeting today uh, so we could have a good a smooth interactive session. I really want to especially thank the HIV AIDS committee members for continuing to serve and to give of themselves selflessly. Thank you to Deacon Hughes who made it today and assisted with the hosting as well. And I would like to thank you brothers and sisters for joining us for this discussion. And now that we are armed with even more knowledge and recognition of the need to treat people with dignity. We share in this global solidarity 
and share responsibility as we continue to reach out through our ministries. Let us pray. Worthy is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Our God of promise, today we are mindful of our sisters and brothers suffering with HIV and AIDS. We place them before you at a critical time during the COVID-19 pandemic, where there can be breakdown in essential HIV services and slowing down in the provision of these services may leave many vulnerable populations at greater risk of infection and AIDS-related deaths. We ask, O oh Lord, for your healing presence on those that are living with the disease today. Make of us a safe heaven, haven for those who are abandoned, discriminated against, and rejected on account of their illness. Inspire us to speak out for a just distribution of health care and medical aid, and for generosity in sharing our resources with those that are struggling under the weight of this epidemic. As we begin our Advent celebration of waiting in hope for the birth of your son, let us remember all those across the world who wait in hope for help. We surrender our hearts today and we give you control. We ask you to bring peace to our minds, O oh Lord, as we ponder on so much that is happening, our financial, physical, mental, and emotional burdens. We remember, Father, your words in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Amen. Amen. And now, benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks again to our presenters, to our hosts, to our audience. Thank you for joining and have a wonderful evening.